Hello and welcome back to another Lo-Fi session with me, Steve White. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying these and I'm having a lot of fun doing them. So today I'm going to talk about a song that was from the Wildwood album. It's called Has My Fire Really Gone Out? Now there is a full transcription in my book, uh, The Art of Drumming, co-written with Russ Tarley. And Russ has done a fantastic job noting down every note from the original record, which uh, I couldn't do. Um, so... A great time, a fantastic album in my opinion. Uh, I love the lyrics, I love the music, some fabulous songs on it. Two particular lines that really stood out. Um, Put an end to all the doubt, has my fire really gone out, which uh, feature in the song. I felt that were very pertinent to the time. Obviously, um, Paul had had phenomenal success with the jam and then the style council. And then at, as a gentleman in his uh, very early 30s was um, starting out as a solo artist. Now. Just as a time shift, it's not such a big deal now, it's no big deal to go and see an artist in their 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s. But there was a little more prejudice around that time, you know, about being old and being has-beens. And, and, you know, you kind of got a little bit of an element of that cynicism sometimes, a little bit of hint of it from the press, which were far more powerful, I guess, in those days. Not that we were particularly bothered. It was always about the fans for us. Um, but now it's, it's, you know, the music press is a fairly weak and ineffective and fairly sycophantic sort of entity. But back then it was quite sort of, uh, it was quite powerful. And I think, not that he would be bothered, but it was a kind of a message of like, you know, has my fire really gone, really gone out? Check this out. I think you'll find it hasn't, which I, I loved. I loved being behind that. So the drumming on the record was not particularly um, uh, clever. It was not particularly sort of, um, you know, technical. It was fairly simple um, rock fair, I suppose. But I, I wanted a kind of a swing to it. Um, so there is a kind of a repetition in the um, in the two bar pattern with a, a little sort of a little grace note, a little accent at the end of a uh, bar two, which gives it a like, bit more of a rolling feel. But the um, intro was interesting because, like, you know, so many things, we didn't do everything um, by the book. And Paul wanted something a little bit more um, rhythmically interesting to introduce the song. And what would happen live is he would just say, you know, if it was in the set, I'd get the nod and... I would play the drum fill, which is essentially just triplets, but I'm accenting the, uh, the right hand, right, left, right and then playing a triplet, then right, left, right, and right, left, right, and it sounds really nice. The thing about it was that I didn't start it on beat one, which is, uh, you know, sort of par for the course, um, but we got used to that. I, I started it on beat two, so it would be one, two, three, four, one. And that kind of just stuck, stuck from when we uh, did the uh, original recording, which I think uh, Marco Nelson was on bass. Um, so many great musicians during that period. I mean, obviously, from the first solo album to Wildwood to Stanley Road on to Heavy Soul even was seven years, which um, in, in music life is, is the life of the Beatles, which is about as uh, kind of go good as it actually got. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a countenance with the lyrics to that sort of cynicism that the um, and that the press had maybe at the time. Um, I do remember a very senior figure uh, in Universal, which is Universal now, but it was the Polygram Group then, saying to me, oh, are you still working with Paul? And I was like, yeah, yeah, new album's coming out. Uh, I don't know why you're wasting your time with that. It's all over that stuff. And yeah, of, of course, that person is still in their job now. Um, kind of most of those execs at the time were very... Um, white middle class, uh, there were very few black people working in the upper echelons of record labels, there were definitely no Asians, um, very few women apart from as secretaries and press officers, um, and I, I hope things have changed, I don't have a lot to do with it anymore, but I'm assuming they have all for the better. So this particular song with the drumming, I kept things very, very simple once I'd done that intro. Um, there's, as I say, like a cyclical two bar feel to the, to the drums. So that little skip in the second bar, and that kind of just repeats until we get to um, like the, the bridge section, where all I did was just kind of doubled the um, doubled the the, the hi hat up from an eighth note to a sixteenth note groove. So if we're going by Changing Man again, it's all about subdivisions. <laughs>
there you kind of have it, the verse and the, the bridge section and going into the choruses where I took essentially the main um, groove and just put it up onto the ride cymbal. So that for me worked, I didn't really need to do anything else on that. Now when we were recording, and I recall it was Marco on bass and maybe Dr Robert on guitar, I think Paul did a lot of the other stuff and Brendan and Max uh, down at the manor, um, Paul just kept playing and the in the, the ending turned into something that I kind of think that reminded me a little bit of the kind of things that Pete Townsend did um, uh, or does uh, with The Who, especially where Mooney was playing drums, where it's like it's like sonic kind of uh, sonic joy from the guitar, um, just like strummed notes or effects or, or whatever. And, you know, I, I kind of think Miles Davis could probably jam along to some of the stuff that that Pete, Pete was doing on guitar. And Paul had that little element and we were kind of really into that sort of, sort of idea and we did it on Shadow of the Sun where we just kind of kept playing as the, um, when, when the song actually finished and, and got, got like almost like a separate outro and we did it on Heavy Soul as well. But on this particular tune, Paul just kept the, a, a sort of single chord going. There's only two chords or a modulation in the whole of that outro and a lot of it was just on, on eye contact, a, a nod, and that's what happened live. But I could hear in the studio the, the guitar was just sort of pulsing away and um, I just kind of waited a little bit and then I thought oh wait right, let's go for it I would make things a little more syncopated um, and go up to the right symbol and a few little uh, accents that I would put in, a few little pushes. Um, when it goes to the, the chord change, I actually start to do something that I did quite a lot on a few different songs. Uh, if any of you know Out of the Sinking. Then I'm using the floor tom as a, a, for ride. I'm riding actually on the floor tom. I did it with Sunflower. And I did it with, um, I, I did it uh, on uh, Porcelain Gods a little bit, and I did it on um, uh, um, Gilded Splinters. So that kind of thing was quite common because I really liked the low end that it, the, the, the Tom gave, uh, goes to, to that kind of particular lineup of the band. So. As it goes to that change, I just literally switched the um, the ride pattern from the 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 the, the ride symbol. which give it a really nice kind of effect and that's something that I took on, that little idea of moving between the ride cymbal and the floor tom uh, when we did a song called World's, Whirlpool's End which was on Stanley Road and I literally in there had a little drum break in that and the, the main sort of drum pattern was this. which is actually a bit of a nick from Ringo um, that I got via my good friend uh, Greg Bissonette. Um, but when it goes to the drum break, I actually play the um, ride cymbal and the floor tom altern alternately. So I'm playing this. So that was, you know, something, uh, a little technique that I got into, moving between the ride symbol. So I did that on the end of um, Has My Fire Really Gone Out, and it kind of really, it really worked. When we started to play it live, obviously, we got a little bit more sort of out there on it. And I used to really enjoy just that idea that we were kind of just free-forming in a sort of a, 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 an electric guitar sort of fashion. Um, and I would put in sort of fills that were like sort of, 30 second note fills so the groove would be like
and that would be the uh, subdivision of the fill. But you'd kind of move it around the kit. And then I'd also get into the, to the thing of taking things across the beat, which again was sort of influenced by Keith Moon. So that kind of thing, it was great fun to do. Um, and you can just kind of hear those little ideas coming out um, as I was developing it and some of the live stuff. There's a brilliant version of the song on the Wolverhampton Civic Hall um, Livewood tour, which was fantastic with Steve and, and Yolanda and Helen. Um, so yeah, that's definitely one of my favorites. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it and come back again soon for another um, look at another classic maybe, or. We've got some new music coming out soon with Hagen White, a fantastic new single um, called Something with a, 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 a little thing on the B side or the B side, which is a lovely little instrumental. So thanks for your time and I'll see you again.